Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Uh, once I started being a psalm or a wine guy at the restaurant, the one thing I'm constantly battling is sweet versus dry when it comes to wine. These two terms have fairly specific meanings to someone like me, but to the general public, they actually mean something different. I get these kinds of scenarios even more in retail now. Something like, I want a wine that's not too sweet, but not too dry. It also needs to be smooth and taste good. Or, where are your sweet wines? Or, I need a dry wine for cooking. Newsflash! In the world of wine, all but a small percentage of wine is classified as dry, as in it has less than a certain amount of sugar in the wine. What's even more confusing, though, is that even within the industry, what constitutes a dry wine can be different for different wines. Ready to take sweetness in wine 401? Let's do a deep dive in what is sweet versus dry in wine and how we perceive it. The big issue is that we as humans perceive ripeness of fruit as sweetness. So something will taste sweet, but has a low amount of sugar. That's how those diet drinks and foods mess with our brains. They taste sweet, but they don't have the calories or carbohydrates that sugar does. Take a red wine. What I call dry is usually under a certain amount of sugar. Depending on who you talk to, a dry wine can be anywhere from 4 to 5 grams per liter to as much as 10 grams per liter of sugar. Most humans start perceiving sugar at the 10 to 25 grams per liter. I seem to remember that our threshold of perceiving sweetness is closer to about 5 grams per liter, but it's not really noticeable as sugar until you get to 10 grams per liter. At least that's how I understand it. A lot of factors come into play here with wine, but this is just straight up tasting sugar. In some parts of the world, this dryness is regulated. However, it depends on the wine in the region. In the U.S., there really isn't a real regulation about this. In other words, we don't have AVAs with a dryness regulation, a law that dictates a wine needs to be under a specific amount of sugar to be considered dry, or conversely, over a specific amount of sugar to be considered not dry. Some of the most popular wines in the world, mainly red wines with names everyone knows, will have upwards of 9, 12, 15, 17 grams a liter, grams per liter or more of residual sugar, also known as RS. And they are not considered dessert wines. Here are some wines with higher residual sugar than you may realize. I took these directly from the Liquor Control Board of Ontario's website. They and another Canadian online wine shop, among others I'm sure, sent every wine they sell to be analyzed so the RS they publish truly is what is in the wine. Now as a side note, in researching for this episode, I did find wines that didn't have the RS values on the LCBO site. Just an indication of sweetness level, like dry or extra dry or sweet. All right, so starting with the reds. Camus Cabernet Sauvignon comes in at around 9 grams per liter. Conundrum Red, another Wagner wine, is at 11 grams per liter. Austin Hope, out of Paso Robles, also has 11 grams per liter of RS. The very popular Menage a Trois Red Blend clocks in at 15 grams per liter. And for this list, Mayomi Pinot Noir tops the list at 17 grams per liter. So if you tell me that Mayomi is sweet, you are correct. It is a sweet wine, not dessert wine sweet, but it's sweet. <laughs> Onto the white wines, I only pulled information on three. Starting with Kendall Jackson Vintner's Reserve Chardonnay at 9 grams per liter. Moving on to Barefoot Pinot Grigio with 10 grams per liter of RS. Finally, we have Apothic White at 21 grams per liter of RS. Definitely not a dry wine, nor is it being marketed as such. The confusion is that while we may perceive sugar at a concentration level of a few grams per liter, other factors come into play with what we call sweet. One of the biggest things we confuse for sugar or sweetness 
is how ripe the fruits in a wine taste. This is a direct correlation to the final ripeness of the grapes at harvest. A high amount of sugar at harvest does a couple things. One, it can equate to a higher amount of RS, but it also contributes to how ripe the fruit aromas and flavors come across. Fruit and wine that tastes sweet is commonly called fruit forward. We taste ripe blackberry or strawberry or cherry or whatever. The riper it tastes, the sweeter it tastes, even for wines that are only two to three grams per liter of RS. So I try to narrow down if someone wants a fruity or fruit forward wine, or they truly want something like an off dry dessert wine. For our purposes, these are pretty equal, but technically a dessert wine is very sweet. More on that later. Another thing that makes wine taste sweeter is alcohol. The higher the alcohol, the sweeter a wine appears. This also applies to beer, uh, those imperial IPAs or imperial uh, stouts taste sweeter. A lot of that is due to them being the eight to 12% ABV, even more in some cases. So those juicy Zinfandels sitting at 15% or higher alcohol may only have four to five grams per liter of sugar, but we perceive it as sweet. Before we move on, let's talk about some sweet merch. I now have a line of merchandise for WWTV and what I call my hashtag outstanding line of merchandise. The outstanding line is all about positivity, is based upon my response of outstanding. One asked how I'm doing. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories on Zazzle. Those are really for the WWTV side. Check out this sweet logo t-shirt, eh? Anyway, the outstanding line is all t-shirts right now. So far, I've only have a small number of variations of t-shirts for both lines with more to come. I have added a few more to the WWTV line and you'll start seeing me wear these shirts uh, on camera. There's a link below in the description, so please check them out. Okay, back to our subject matter, sparkling wines. Now, they have a standard of measurement of sweetness. For sparkling wines, many countries have legally determined sweetness levels and here's a chart of champagne sweetness levels. And actually most other styles of sparkling wine will follow these definitions. First you have Brut Nature, has zero to three grams of sugar per liter. We would consider that bone dry. Next is Extra Brut, that's zero to six grams per liter. We call that dry, but not as dry as Brut Nature. Then there's Brut. Now that's zero to 12 grams per liter. Now, as you can see, Brut can be zero to 12, so you can call something brute, but it's really brute nature, or you can call it extra brute. Now, this will have a hint of sweetness at the high end, but it's still considered dry. So it, it, at 12 grams per liter, you might taste a little bit of sweetness, but if it's like six you know, or lower, it's gonna be dry, even though they're gonna label it as brute. I'm gonna talk about these terms here in a second. Extra dry, that's 12 to 17 grams per liter. Slightly sweet. Now we're starting to get really confusing here, right? Then we have sec or dry between 17 and 32 grams of liter per uh, of sugar per liter. This is moderately sweet. Also kind of confusing, right? Then we have demi sec between 32 to 50 grams. Uh, and that's meaning half dry, right? That's sweet, but not dessert wine sweet, okay? Then you have dew, which is 50 plus grams of liter per sugar. This is the sweetest of sparkling wines. This would be what we call dessert wine sweet. Now it's 50 plus, like it could be 100 grams. There's no like other level up there. The thing is that you have, you have Brut Nature, Extra Brut, and then Brut. Okay, that kind of makes sense. But then you have the Extra Dry and Dry. But Brut's dry. So it's very confusing, even for people like me, if you're not constantly dealing with the sweetness levels in champagne or sparkling wines, sometimes you get confused with extra dry and extra brute. So it can happen. And then we try to explain to somebody, they kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? I just wanna know if it's sweet or dry, right? All right, so the trick here is that acid and sugar form a sort of balancing act. Too much of one or the other will yield a wine that may come across as unpleasant to most people. I'll get this a little bit. With Riesling, you can get anywhere from bone dry to dessert wine sweet. Alsace and Austria mostly produce dry to bone dry Riesling. By law, Riesling from the Alsace can't have more than nine grams per liter of residual sugar. That may sound like a lot, but remember, we don't taste sugar until we get to 10, 10 grams per liter, supposedly. So in Alsace, that's still dry, and it does come across as dry. 
In Austria, most of the areas require four grams per liter or less of RS. If not, then it's gonna be a nine grams per liter uh, of RS like Alsace, or I can't really find any regulation about it. In general, Alsace and Austria only produce dry Riesling and other grapes, unless they are intentionally producing a dessert wine style like Vendage Tardive or Selection des Grands Nobles, or Baron Auslese or Trockenbaron Auslese. All will have these terms or something similar to identify them as dessert wines. Now, all this talk about Riesling, the point is that Riesling is one of the highest acid grapes there is that we make wine from. So this residual sugar is used to balance out the wine. So the Germans, when they have this cabinet style, they call it the, a fruity style. It's going to have probably in that 9 to maybe 15 or maybe 6 to 15 grams per liter sugar. You don't really get that from those wines. I mean, I'm sure you can find the information, but they like to talk about the sugar ripeness level. That's what cabinet means at harvest. And then you got to translate that into what the RS is, but you have to actually do fermentation. So it's not like a, and they use uh, the Eschel scale. And I, if it's like 200, if it's like 200 Eschel, that doesn't mean it's 10 grams per liter of sugar at the end. It all depends on how it's fermented. You know, if it goes to 8%, 10%, 12%. But the point is with Riesling, just like sparkling wine, the acidity is balanced by the residual sugar. Now, there are red grapes like Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir, which are well known to retain their acidity by harvest time. The difference is wine made from grapes like that have enough fruit characteristics to counteract the elevated acidity. Now, to be clear, the acid in grapes like Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir isn't as high as Pinot Grigio or Riesling. Then you add tannin to the mix. In red wine, that's what dries out your mouth. It's kind of like my mouth right now, so it's not tannin. Same thing as tea leaves. So a wine like Barolo, which is made from Nebbiolo, has high tannin, fairly high acid, and it's usually fermented to almost complete dryness, like four grams per liter of sugar or less. That's a dry wine. If you use a grape like Zinfandel with less tannin, less acid, fermentation stops when you're around six to 10 grams per liter of sugar, the fruit was really ripe to begin with. And because the fruit was really ripe and the RS is a bit higher, the alcohol is in that 15% or higher range. Uh, but that wine is still dry, but many people think it's at least a little bit sweet. Now, I visited the Wine Folly website during my research on this. Madeline Puckett is the founder, and she has a lot of excellent information and graphics. To help explain some of this, I'll show you uh, two graphics she has on red and white wines. These graphs will give you a simplified version of wines in their typical sweetness levels. At first glance, the graphic can look a bit confusing because you may read something like Malbec as being around 10 to 12% sweetness, but all the grapes from Sangiovese to Zinfandel fall in that dry category. Basically wines that are under 10 grams per liter, not 10%. 10% on our chart would equal 100 grams per liter of sugar. So that's why something like Zinfandel is called dry. You'll see Lambrusco Dolce, AKA sweet Lambrusco, is solidly in the medium sweet section. So 60 to 90 grams per liter, according to the chart. Then we get the ports in that 140 or so grams per liter. On to the whites. Muscadet and Tarantes are typically dry. Then come the off dry wines of the 30 to 80 grams per liter, like Gewürztraminer and Riesling. Examples of them would be the Vendage Tardive in the Selection des Grands Nobles from Alsace, and the Baron Auslese and Trockenbaron Auslese from Germany or Austria. By the way, Muscat and Pinot Gris in Alsace and Gruner Veltliner in Austria can also be in these categories. As far as Spätlese and Auslese, these wines could either be in the bottom of this range or in the technically dry range. VT and SGN are roughly the equivalent to Auslese and Baron Auslese, respectively. German wine can be a bit confusing when it comes to sweetness. There is a system of ripeness I've already alluded to rather than sweetness. It's called the Pradekatswein, or Pradekat for short. It has six levels from least ripe to ripe, starting with Cabinet, or the fruity style, Spätlese, Auslese, Baron Auslese, and Eiswein. These are the same ripeness level. And then the Trocken Baron Auslese. In general, Cabinet will be technically dry in that its final residual sugar will be a about 10 grams per liter or less, kind of depends on the final alcohol. I've already mentioned that the Germans frequently call this their fruity style. 
Spätlese and Auslese can also be under 30 grams per liter, or they can be over. It all depends on the winery and how sweet they want the wine to taste and how high in alcohol they want the wine to be. Typically, they will fall in that off-dry category. The last three will almost always be in the sweet category, though it is possible to be at or near the top of off-dry, but it's probably it's not it's gonna really give me the sweet category. German wine law only specifies the sugar content at harvest, not the final sugar, like I've already said, except when it comes to wines labeled trocken or dry. Then it mostly follows the Alsace regulations of no more than nine grams per liter of RS. Austrian wines can also follow this Pradikat system, though the sugar content at harvest may be a bit different. Confusing, right? Yeah. And moving on, then we have the sweet stuff like Moscato, white port, and ice wine that clocks in 100 grams per liter of sugar or higher. Just to circle back a bit, ice wine, Baron Auschleiser, and SGNs are roughly equivalent in sweetness. And then Trocken Baron Auschleiser is even sweeter. These last four are pretty rare compared to the rest of sweet wines from Germany, Austria, and Alsace. And these charts don't even include the truly sweet stuff like Sautern and Tokai, which can approach 400 plus grams per liter of sugar. The point with these charts is that most wine is technically or legally dry. So when you ask for a dry wine, those of us in the industry are like, yes, almost all my wines are dry. What do you want? <laughs> Let's add another wrinkle to all of this. Acid. I told you I'd eventually get to this. I hinted about all this when referring to certain grapes as being high acid or retaining acid. Acidity in a wine plays a big part in how we perceive sweetness in general. It's a balancing act with sugar. I've kind of already covered this, but I'm going to cover it again. This comes into play with champagne or just sparkling wine in general. It also is a factor in high acid grapes like Riesling. Let's compare it to a soft drink like Coke. Now, this is probably not the best example, but I like to use the Coke example because it's what people are familiar with. So it's going to be a bit complicated and it's going to have kind of an apples versus oranges comparison, but here it goes. Put your thinking cap on. And how we measure sugar in wine, a Coke will have about 100 grams per liter of sugar. So definitely sweet like those last wines on the chart. To balance that, phosphoric acid is added. Now, colas, including Coke, also have citric acid and carbonic acids. These two have some effect, but phosphoric acid is the key for balance. The actual amount of phosphoric acid is actually pretty low, somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.7 grams per liter. Sparkling wine is around 10 to 12 grams per liter of mostly tartaric acid. Now, this is the major acid in grapes. There's three to four other major acids, and there's a bunch of minor acids. But tartaric is the acid when we talk about acid in general. The key, here is how, the key here is that the intensity of these two acids is different. And considering pH, all right, more complicated chemistry, uh, the pH of Coke is around 2.5. And wine can be anywhere from 2.8 to 4. Just a quick and dirty on pH. pH measures intensity or perception of acid rather than the amount of acid. However, we all tend to use pH as a measure of acidity because it's close enough, it's how we perceive it, right? Both phosphoric and tartaric acids are considered weak acids, but can have a low pH. This depends on a lot of factors, but let's just try to keep it simple for right now. From what I can find out, phosphoric acid is considered a stronger acid than tartaric, but not by much. The sugars in each is different. High fructose corn syrup, the main sugar in Coke or other colas, is a sweeter sugar than glucose, which is the main sugar in wine. It's also not by much, but it takes less high fructose corn syrup to achieve the same sweetness as glucose. Most of the wines I'm talking about here have way less than 100 grams per liter of sugar. And while the amount of acid is higher than a Coke, the overall pH is lower. So a Coke is considered a higher acid drink and therefore it needs more sugar to balance it. Remember, the phosphoric acid is added to Coke and not the other way around. The acid is used to balance the sugar, but still keep it sweet. But realize, a Coke at 100 grams per liter of sugar is not considered as sweet, won't taste as sweet as a Baron Auschleser. It's the acid that's giving you that balance. So the bottom line here with acid and sugar is that the lower the pH or higher the acid, 
a wine is, the more residual sugar is needed to balance the wine. And this balance is subjective and it depends on the goal of the winemaker. So for acid heads like me and most industry people, we will gravitate towards Brut Natur Champagne, drier Rieslings, and other high acid wines. We will like that the acid is more prominent instead of being balanced. I mean, it's still balanced to us. At the same time, we will appreciate the higher acid in a sweeter wine precisely because there is balance. It can be very confusing for the consumer. We in the industry sound like we are speaking a different language and because you know what? Well, we are in some ways. Uh, we want to make sure you are getting the style of wine you want. So it's difficult to know exactly what a person really means. We can only ask questions to narrow down what the average consumer wants. At least in a restaurant or bar situation, I can give someone a taste within reason. I can't always give someone a taste of something I only serve by the bottle, but I can try the by the glass route first. One of the best things you can do as a consumer is remember the names of the wines you enjoy. The actual producer name is the best or take pictures. This is how, this is how Psalms do it. We take pictures of everything. This will help us as Psalms understand what you mean by sweet or dry. This is really the best for just about everything concerning wine. So the bottom line, again, is most wine is dry. It's just that some wines taste fruitier than others. Most people who say sweet don't really mean that. They mean fruit forward with a little bit higher amount of residual sugar. But hey, maybe they do want that Mayomi or Apothic White with 17 or 21 grams per liter sugar. And with that, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends. And until next time, drink some dry wine. Peace.